Well, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to Prop Talk, a real estate management podcast that's powered by Resmond. I am Elizabeth Francisco, the CXO of Inhabit, and I also serve on Resmond's strategic leadership team. And I am your host again for today's episode, <laughs> Blending Science and Storytelling for Personal and Business Success. So I am thrilled to introduce Amber Hurdle a dynamic force in the world of branding and leadership. So I saw a keynote that Amber did for the vacation rental management software industry. And I was just blown away. I was taking notes like crazy. I was was like front row, most won't surprise those of you that know me, just sitting right up front. And uh, I immediately thought that like her innovative approach to blending the science and um, the science with the storytelling to help fortify brands and how you do it from the inside out is just something that our industry on the multifamily side of, of long-term rentals um, is something we could benefit from. So I reached out. She was very gracious. Actually, I stalked her. So let's be fair. Um, and I asked her to come on to Prop Talk and share her insights on personal and corporate branding, which I really do believe will help multifamily leaders elevate their businesses and their teams to new heights. This is an important topic. So first and foremost, Welcome to Prop Talk. Thanks for having me, Elizabeth. I'm super excited to be here. I'm glad that you stalked me. That's my style of picking up new friends myself. <laughs> I'm like, you are interesting and really smart and you will be my friend. So that was one of the best keynotes. I loved the way that you kicked it off for the women's event. <laughs> um, I was just really impressed and it was so much fun, but it was everybody was just hanging on everything that you said. And I think your talents and your skill set they definitely transcend industry boundaries. So, um, that. and I know, and I, w- I was going to talk about it first, but I'm like, no, no, she needs to tell it because you also have some similarities in your own personal story that are very relatable to a lot of us that started in multifamily and the way we came up from the front lines into leadership positions all over the country. Um, Cause nobody grows up saying, I want to be in property management for multifamily. <laughs> <laughs> At least they did. We need to fix that. So could you just tell us a little bit about, because I know it, but could you tell us a little bit about your personal story, um, about how you, how you came into the role that you are? Sure. Yeah. So um, I often joke, I got knocked up at 16. Okay. (laughs) So I was the good girl. I was um, on channel four news at six and 10, five days in a row. I was one of about a dozen students that were featured for being great kids And they were interviewing us because they wanted to have conversations with students about conversations their parents were not having with them. So we're going to talk to some of the top teenagers in the mid-state. I was one of them. And so, of course, one of the topics was sex. Mm -hmm. And so I've got, I'm, I'm sitting in this quad in the middle of Lebanon High School And, you know, the camera crews have been following me around and I'm just like, you know, the Kardashians before the Kardashians were there. Everybody's like, Amber's got a news camera on her. Like, let's go walk with Amber. You know, it was like this whole thing. And so they've got this camera on me and the lovely reporter says, so, Amber, parents seem to think that all teenagers are having sex. Is that true? I'm like 16, maybe late 15. Oh, my God. Yeah. With the camera staring. And I just in my fresh Valley Girl accent, because I just moved from from California. Uh-huh. No, nah, not everybody's having sex. Guess what soundbite they used to tease the news at six and ten. Oh. So yeah, I'd get home from school and it'd be like, we're talking with the mid-state teenagers. Don't you blah, love blah, how blah. They do that. Cut to Amber. <laughs> no, nah, not everybody's having sex. And then two weeks later, I found out I was with child. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And it was not an immaculate conception. Her name was not Jesus. But <laughs> That's how you start prop talk, people. <laughs> yeah. So now that everybody's hooked, because um, we're being, I'm team captain of team Keep It Real. Team Keep It Real. That's it. And, and that's, you know, I, I appreciate the lovely things that you said about my speaking style, but I, I really just think that that's what it boils down to. I have a microphone. That's the only difference between me and anybody in that audience. Like, you're a brilliant woman. We have a very similar story. You've overcome a lot. Look what you've done in your career. Mm-hmm. I, they just handed me the microphone, you know? But I will say that one commonality, and of course I have real estate and everything in my background, but when I was much younger, I was a manager of storage units Mm. because I could live on property Mm. with (laughs) my daughter. Mm -hmm. And guess who storage unit makes friends with? Mm -hmm. Multifamily. Yes. We're best friends. So I knew all of the apartment complex managers in in where where I was. So um, 
you know, there's just a lot of similarities about coming up as a woman and we had it. And I'm not saying it's easy for women now, but mm -hmm. our daughters certainly have a different experience than what yeah. we had coming up. Yeah. And, you know, just to be a woman in business, to be a powerful woman in business, mm -hmm. and then to also have the label of single mom or desperate mom, or we can do this because she has to have this job. Yes. There's a lot that goes with that. Yep. So, you know, this industry and why I'm so passionate about it has been a safe haven for so many people that have a speed bump in the road, right? Their, their careers or their journeys, whatever they thought they were going to do, somehow they find themselves on a different path. And the thing that's always been special about this industry is the opportunities we provide. Yeah. So many people, like people don't realize how much we contribute to the national, the, the gross national product. Sure. Um, and how many people we employ. And I always used to say that you could come up through multifamily. You could learn everything you needed to, to learn about running a multi-million dollar business, but you didn't have to walk out with the four years of student loan. I still <laughs> love that about this industry. So that's why I thought you, you would be very relatable to a lot of people in our audience. And also like, just the challenges that people still have in leadership and the changing economy and the market conditions and how competitive everything's being. And so there was two reasons why I thought about your personal story and just being a strong powerhouse woman that you are. But I also thought about everybody I hear about tightening budgets and marketing. Oh, wow. Yeah. And every time I hear that, I just cringe because you can't run your business in a short term mindset because especially multifamily, we have to think long term. Yeah. And what you don't do today, you will pay for tomorrow. Amen. That's why she's here, people. <laughs> you do have such a, a strong approach to business. So kind of walk us a little bit further. Like, How did you go from that <laughs> and living on site in the storage facility, right, above, you know, upside or above storage facility, to getting where you are today and doing what you're doing out speaking to the masses? So as one can imagine, a teen mom, mm -hmm. I had a credit score of 433. It's 833 now, just so you know. I'm like a dead person, but um, <laughs> it was 433 <laughs> at the time because I couldn't pay my bills and I was constantly trying to not get my car repossessed. But I called a fitness <laughs> center. I was starting to kind of get in the groove. I, I had gone to Financial Peace University. I was paying off debt and all that kind of stuff. And I actually had good income. I was also getting bonuses from renting rider trucks or whatever. And so that was part of my my storage unit thing. So I had kind of like a couple streams of income at that point. And so I called the co-owner of the fitness center that I was at in, in the city that I lived in. And I said, Johnny, I owe you $44 plus whatever interest or anything that, that I, I owe at this point. He goes, no. Oh, Amber, I wrote that off forever ago. And I was like, no, no, no. I insist. I, I owe it to you. I, okay. I broke my lease. And so he goes, what are you doing now? So I tell him what I'm doing. And he's like, oh, so you're in sales. I was like, well, sales, management, operations, kind of a little bit of all of it, marketing, public relations, which I didn't know what PR was at the time, but that's what I did. He goes, huh, you should come talk to me. You should sell some gym memberships. And I was <laughs> like, oh, I think I'm good. And I'm a fit person. I used to be a member at the gym. I was like, I'm good. And he just insisted. So I went and interviewed with him and that changed my life. His wife, Peggy Keel, who is the owner, the founder, is still my work mom. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, I had like a two hour conversation with her. She's Aww. still who I go to. She was the first person to introduce me to personality assessment. So she gave me the DISC assessment and we were very similar in our styles. You know, I was that really dangerous combination of super confident and also ignorant because I was young. I was like 21. And she knew that feeling and she mm -hmm. just nurtured me and Johnny nurtured me. So because of that, I met more people Then I ended up in higher education and fundraising for side money. I created a little event planning company because some of the wealthier women who are now some of my dearest friends would hire me to like do their little garden parties around the, the pool or whatever. And so I'm just trying to make a little college fund for my daughter. And then before I knew it, by gosh, I had a celebrity event planning company and I'm planning events for Alan Jackson, Carrie Underwood, John Rich paid my bills for like a solid couple of years. That shifted things. I had a major loss, which I won't get into all of that, but a, a, a huge loss in the family. I ended up at the University of Georgia. Mm -hmm. And what that did was it exposed me to so much of a really well-run foundation mm -hmm. Um, and it exposed me to a lot of the top senior leaders in the world, mm -hmm. Coca-Cola, Aflac, Chick-fil-A. These are people that were sitting on my boards that I would have to attend events with. So I'm like with the senior vice president of finance for Coca-Cola International and the senior vice president of people operations for AT&T worldwide. Like these are people that I'm just my normal life. And so mm -hmm. you can imagine how much that elevated Mm -hmm. how I perceive business and how much it solidified my little budding yeah. business acumen that I'd kind of figured out from all my little companies I'd started over the years. Left there, again, long story, 
end up with Gaylord Hotels. I've never been pushed so hard professionally in my entire life. Learned a lot about um, people processes yeah. and and how important. We, we use a service profit chain, which is a Harvard business model, okay. to, in order to ensure that we take care of our people so they will take care of our customers and then we all make money. It's great. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of my branding philosophy is yeah. if you have strong personal brands, strong leaders where your people feel good, they feel seen, they feel their psychological safety, they know that they can Mm -hmm. be themselves and show up as themselves and be celebrated and contribute to something bigger because their leader allows that. Now you have happy employees. Mm -hmm. And so we put some systems in place. My entire job there was to keep our employees happy. 100% of my job and my entire staff's. Mm -hmm. That was our only job. I didn't do coaching, counseling, discipline. I didn't do hiring. I didn't do anything like that. All I did was make our employees happy. You can imagine why I do what I do now. The brands that you mentioned have successful track record yeah. of branding <laughs> yeah. in general. Yeah. So it, what, a, what an amazing opportunity for you to have that exposure. Yeah. Um, but then to go to a company like Gaylord and that is so people focused. Yeah. Which kind of does explain like how you've got this bridge now. Yeah. And how you can piece them together. And I don't think people always think about it. Like, you know, I bring up branding. I can tell you they're thinking about how am I branding the company? How am mm-hmm. I branding the community? What's the logo? Yeah. What are the colors? What are the fonts? Yeah. And if you bring up the concept of branding, like helping your employees with their personal brands, how you can bring that all back full circle is like what I'm so excited to talk about. And now that's why you're a great person to talk about <laughs> is everything we you just shared with us. Well, what happened was at Gaylord is we had a poison pill in place for two, two times and there was kind of a hostile takeover situation. Okay, explain the poison pill. I'm not, I'm so not familiar with that. The poison pill means like you cannot take us over. You, okay. So the, um, the, I won't get too much into it, but there is another another man mm-hmm. at another um, hotel brand okay. who felt like we were not running things the way that he would prefer for us to run. And stock market does not like for hotels to own their dirt and also to own the management rights. Okay. So we knew that we had to find somebody to take over the management rights. And then Gaylord um, Mm -hmm. ended up becoming a REIT. And so the last thing that I did before I left Gaylord Hotels was I internally rebranded to Marriott. Oh, wow. And so that was truly my first foray of M&A work. I mean, cut your teeth on the largest hotel brand in the whole freaking world. So what I told my team was we can lick our wounds and be upset that you know, we're kind of getting a divorce and corporate's going over in this way and then the hotels are going over here mm-hmm. and then the G-Jack's going over here and like, who, which parent do you love and all that kind of stuff. Or <laughs> we can look at it as, hey guys, on your resume, you can put that you ran the people operations for the largest Marriott hotel in the world. Are we going to learn from this or are we going to groan about this? So yeah. let's learn. So mm-hmm. again, just little breadcrumbs, as I like to call it, when you're trying to work on your personal brand, I always say, follow your breadcrumbs, go back to your past, look mm-hmm. at those commonalities. And when I look at that and why I love the M&A space so much right now is mm-hmm. is just there's complexities with employer brands that impact the consumer experience, that impact your customer mm-hmm. experience, which ultimately impacts your bottom line. And I don't even yeah. mean ultimately, like immediately impacts yes. your bottom line. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, you have to understand the intricacies of what it feels like to mm-hmm. either acquire a business or businesses, which you've been through, yep. or to be acquired, to merge brands, to yeah. go, well, okay, well, what's what's in common with the culture of this company? What's in common with the culture of, th- what are, what's our leadership language? Mm-hmm. What do we value? I mean, it's a lot to try to combine and get everybody moving in the same direction. Interesting, because then when you think about multifamily, right, in the, the space that we're in, and just the base that we have with Resmond, you can see there's a lot of M&A activity oh, happening. So um, there's also some rebranding happening. Yeah. Let's start with M&A activity. What would you say were the things like, like, okay, if you can't do everything, do these things. Okay. So first and foremost, if you have a business strategy, we are acquiring or we've been acquired because mm-hmm. we want to X, Y, and Z. If that's your business strategy, mm-hmm. let's go ahead and put your people strategy in place because guess who's going to get you there? Mm-hmm. It's not a magic fairy. The people have to do it. So what does that mean? What does that look like for them? What is the communication plan for them? Does that change their technology? How are we going to roll that out? Does that change how we talk or communicate with our customers? Does that change who we report to in the structure? Mm-hmm. We have to lay all of that out. And then number two, be transparent. Mm-hmm. This is the hard part because everybody wants to keep things under wraps because everything it's in a state of flux. So it's like, oh, well, when, when we land on that decision, then we'll roll it out. No, go ahead and just tell everybody you're thinking about it yeah. and it might go left or it might go right and you're not sure. But if you're just transparent about it, 
then people are going to feel like they're invested in the process and not like you're hiding something and like you're the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain making everything Mm -hmm. happen. Because if they're insecure about where they are in things or what it means to them, Mm -hmm. what's in it for me? Always ask that question, whether it's your customer or your employee. Third, over communicate, which should be part of your people strategy. But when I say that, I mean, do not talk about EBITDA if you're not willing to explain what EBITDA means to the team members who are busting their behinds to get you there. Did I say that clear enough? Yes. You okay. Did. There are these terms. Yes. Then nobody knows what they mean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> except for the people who are busting their butt to make sure that they meet EBITDA. If that's something that you're going to introduce and that's going to be language used in meetings, and mm-hmm. there's so many terms, but yeah. that's the, the common one. Explain what that means. Explain what the benefit is. This is going to open up more opportunities that's for you. That's the key thing there. I always wonder, too, like in your experience, because I know you do a lot of consulting. Like why is that so hard? I don't want to hang it all on generations, but mm-hmm. generationally, there is a difference. So there was not that transparency. Boomers did not get transparency. Mm-hmm. You just do what you, you were told to do. You're going to work 70 hours and chop, chop, let's go. Like mm-hmm. that's, you know, and then Gen Xers, we were kind of all like, just work my butt off and I'm going to have a side gig over here because I don't trust anybody. Go MTV. We had a different mindset. We work really hard. We have a work mm-hmm. ethic and we're very um, independent. Millennials are in, are in there now and Gen Z is completely expectant of transparency. Mm -hmm. And everybody was raised differently and everybody had different experiences coming through life, both as a collective and personally, just because of the season that we that we grew up in. And so we have different expectations of what work looks like and what Mm -hmm. that experience is going to be. And so if somebody told me this is just how it is, because I have always had a job where senior leadership, I was privy to things. Mm -hmm. I knew there's a reason for this. And actually, Mm -hmm. they're protecting you from the stress. You don't need to know everything going on because you would then be up at night and you're not paid enough to be up at night like these guys are or these gals are. And people (laughs) say that's above my pay grade for a reason. And so there's that. But then there's also when you are dealing in the M&A space, there is a lot of confidentiality. And so there there's things that the investors need not for people to know. And then Mm -hmm. there's there's pieces maybe that things were kind of broken, which is why they needed another raise. I mean, who knows what's going on really behind the scenes. And so I think they're wanting to protect their staff, A, from being worried about, do I have a job or not? Mm -hmm. But here's what happens. And this is where PR comes in. In public relations, PR 101 is you frame the narrative or somebody else will. And so what do you think happens when you're not being transparent about what's actually happening behind the scenes? I'm certified in the change cycle for a reason. And it's you have to move people through that change cycle because there's a part of it where it's like, okay, I'm I'm bitter, I don't like the change. Okay, now I'm kind of getting used to it. But then there's a stage right before the breakthrough where acclimation comes in, okay. where that's where you lose people because they can't take the pain. Oh my gosh. And so if you can walk them through that pain and mm-hmm. just be like, stick with me, stick with the company, here's where we're going and here's how it's going to benefit you. You're going to have more opportunity. We're going to be able to pay you more. We're going to be able to hire more, but we have to get through this uncomfortable season first of like just getting all of our ducks back in yep. a row. My boss, he wrote the the intro to uh, the, the bombshell businesswoman. Yes, I had a man <laughs> because he was the senior vice president at, at Gaylord Hotels when, when all of this was going down. And he used to say things like, we've got to squirrel away our acorns mm-hmm. or we have to put cookies in the cookie jar. And here's what that's going to do for you. If you will take a little bit of your budget, which I know is annoying for this quarter and give it back to the company, then you'll hit your bonus Mm -hmm. because we will financially be on track. And so if you'll give back this amount where you might have done this, that or the other, and that was a project that you wanted to do, you can't. You personally will get thousands of dollars yeah. that you can do what you want to in your life. I love that you just tackled that because I've had those moments over the years. I would like to say I've, I'm always able to like stop what I'm doing and lift my head up and see who needs the attention. And I haven't been able to always able to do it like I want to. But I have been able to do it a lot. And we have a we're blessed at, at Resmond. We have what we call the Resmond OGs. And if you look at like prop tech and SaaS, like the number of people who start with the company at different stages of growth, they dwindle down. And to like, I think it was like five, uh, like within five years, you're like, if you have five, we have a lot more than that. And uh, we're 13, well, we're 10 years in market now. But part of it's because what you just said, I would always get so frustrated when I, I couldn't or I was too late to respond to somebody that I'm like, you just need to hang in there because I know how close we are. And maybe we just got our heads down or buried and we lost sight of communicating mm-hmm. um, or took it for granted. And time just goes by so fast. It does. But I love that you just pointed that out because I don't know if I've heard anybody really articulate it that way because it's a pivotal stage. And 
because you're doing everything up to that point. But you're right. There's still pain happening. Everybody has their point. And so you've got to have those conversations. Um, and, and especially right now where we are post post pandemic, which I hate that we keep talking about it, but it is so dramatically different that that mm-hmm. was a line in the sand. Everything's changing. <laughs> Everything's changed all the time. Things will I, I don't foresee any time in the near future with AI progressing the way that it is. I mean, there's just so much change going on that if you cannot manage change in your organization, mm-hmm. you lose. Yes. Amen. Yes. And, and then let's go back to more science and data. So now you have all these different personalities, all of these different behavioral drives on your team. Mm-hmm. And some people like me, I was made for change. You could have been like, girl, I, I know you just flew into Dallas, but I'm thinking Costa Rica. You want, I'd be like, let me check flights. Like I'm just <laughs> flexible. So the other assessment that I'm going to give you that'll measure some of that too, but I'm on the how to fascinate assessment. We talk about OG. I'm a OG fascinate certified advisor, senior. I'm highest in passion. So that's the language of relationship, but I'm actually tied second because of tiebreaker with innovation, the language of mm-hmm. creativity. So I'm good with that. So yeah. you want me in the change game, right? Yep. But there are some people who Taco Tuesdays every Tuesday. Mm-hmm. They take the same way home from work every single day. Yes. They use the same kind of pots and pans that their mama did. Like they don't love change. It doesn't mean they can't do change. It just means that the minute that they get changed, they're going to put a process behind it. Mm-hmm. So with so many companies now being almost in a startup environment, even though they've been around for a while mm-hmm. because they have to innovate and keep up with what's going on, Yes, you have to bring those people along and and tell them like, okay, we're not going to put a process in place for this quite yet because it's still in flux. Yeah. So let's do a loose process. And then like, let me just hold your hands and sing Kumbaya with you when we change it tomorrow. Just like Kroger, Publix, Macy's, any of them, they have those loyalty cards. Mm-hmm. They're gathering data on you so they know how to respond to you. Mm-hmm. So they know how to treat you in their advertising. So they know what to put in your email of what you should buy next. Yeah. We need to have that kind of data on our people who are mm-hmm. making all the things happen so we can make the money. Exactly. We need to understand who's on our team. Mm-hmm. And whether that's through psychoanalytics like I like to use or even very casual employee engagement surveys like this month. Are you a happy face? A straight face or a sad face. You get too many sad faces b- back from yeah. everybody. That's a conversation with the team. Yeah. You so can't bury your head in the sand. You cannot. No. And so we're so worried about our tech stacks and we're so worried about our marketing strategy. And we're so worried about AI, even though we don't even know what questions to ask to implement AI in the company. Sometimes I'm like, <laughs> stop it. People are so focused on that that they forget human beings are the people that do all of the functions. Your marketing doesn't happen without people. Your yeah. tech stack doesn't happen without people. Input in is input out. Yes. So whatever, whoever's programming it is, yep. the quality is coming out. So mm-hmm. you need to have people data. Yeah. And I love that the, uh, that we're coming back around to talking about how important people are. And I joke about this and okay, y'all have heard this before. In the apartment industry, what's really unique about the products that we provide is we provide service. But in reality, the homes that we provide are unique in that people, they get naked in there. There's nothing more personal. Right. Right. And that's and it's funny because that does definitely translate into the vacation rental management Absolutely. industry. But it's really funny because on the vacation side, I hear the challenging stories. I just grin. And so I've started saying this recently. I'm like, yeah, you guys get them for five days. I'd like you to ponder where they're at the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Just not that I'm one up in y'all. I'm just saying our people might have a little different challenge. And so, yeah, keeping them engaged. And, and you're right. If you take care of the people, the people take care of the business. That's, that's right. That's basics. But it's so funny how we drift so far away from it. Yeah. And I'll tell you, too. So I'm a member of um, ACG, the Association of Corporate Growth, and it's all M&A players, mm-hmm. SMBs. And I was at a panel and they were saying, so just to give some terminology, um, in 2021, there was the most money put into businesses in private equity history. I saw a lot of that in the vacation rental space. Wait a minute. Isn't that when Resmond sold? That's, I'm pretty <laughs> sure that's when that <laughs> happened. We might have helped with that. <laughs> I, might have, I might have watched that happen <laughs> from afar. And so so that was happening. And then as the economy shifted and and just a lot has changed, they sat on the money. On the, on the money. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of what they call dry powder. Right. Just hanging out, waiting to be invested. It has to be invested. Waiting for somebody to get in the pool first. That's right. Right. So guess what's going to happen this year? Oh, by all means, do tell. Yeah. So this year, we got to start making it rain a little bit because this money's been sitting there and it has to be invested. So before, you know, the election, like they're going to start picking things up. So of course I'm asking, I'm like, well, 
As of right now, there's 0.7 human beings available for every open position in the country, according to the United mm -hmm. States. So what does that look like for people who want to be funded, for people who want to, to be mm -hmm. invested in? And they said, well, it doesn't matter how fancy your marketing is. It doesn't matter how operationally efficient you are. If mm -hmm. you cannot hire and retain people, we are uninterested because you have no business. And I said, OK, so what does that look like for frontline hiring? Mm -hmm. I mean, are you moving away from the car washes? Are you moving away from the landscaping companies? Because that's really hard to get that level of hourly frontline mm -hmm. employee to show up every day. And they're like, nailed it. So technology. Oh, we cannot scale vacation rentals like we thought we could. And all of us tried to tell them back then you cannot. That's mm -hmm. very hard business to scale when you have. It's not like a hotel. 300 rooms in a box right. with a with a pool and a, and a hot tub. No, no, yeah. no. They're 300 all doors. <laughs> All over the country. All over. <laughs> and all of them have a pool and all yeah. of them have a hot tub and they all need linens and they're all everywhere. So that's yeah. really hard to scale. And so now instead of just like throwing out money because it's like candy, they're reining it in and being a lot more strategic about where they're putting mm -hmm. this dry powder, which is sitting there waiting to be invested. Yeah. And so we've, if, we've seen it on the multifamily side with real estate. It's funny. It came to a screeching halt, I would say, in 22, the fourth mm -hmm. quarter. And rough start in Q1 of 23 picked back up. I think we're in seeing the exact same pattern right now. And I anticipate that we will see it pick back up. Yeah. And, and it's a little bit different, but you know, long term, the multifamily is still a great place to invest money. We actually have the populations coming in right. and the demand is there. It's just going to be a little willy wonky for a little bit, but we will we will overcome it. Now you have the Gen Zers and the younger millennials who are like, there's no way I can ever buy a house. So their whole mentality is I'm renting for life. Mm. So where do you think they're going? Multifamily, because that's what they can afford and that's yeah. what's realistic for them. And they don't yeah. want to have to deal with all of the expenses that come with yeah. being a homeowner. Circle back a little bit, because as we're talking about, you know, all the M&A activity and, and engaging with your teams through change and change management, we're thinking about developing our team members. That's one of the things that worries me just a little bit in the multifamily industry is as we look to technology to solve problems, technology provider, I'm very yeah. happy about that. But I also know I wouldn't be where I'm at today if I hadn't had the opportunities that I had coming up through the ranks, being out on site, yeah. learning side by side from assistant managers and property managers, and then, you know, having my, my regional network. And so I'm thinking about for young professionals that are in our space today, what does it look like for them? Mm. And, you know, and I, I know there's challenges about loyalty. At one point during the Great Resignation, I saw numbers where we were seeing like 70% churn. Businesses can't sustain that, right? right? We just had a tech conference on our space back in um, October. Every panel had something about AI. I've been impressed by how easily and how willing people are to adopt technology. We're historically like, we well, wait, I need to see that everybody else is on it first <laughs> and I need to make sure everybody's okay with it and then maybe I'll consider it. Yeah. But now it's flipped. I've never seen anything like it, but I don't think there's enough of understanding yet about what it can truly do, what it should do. You're going to lean on this because the reality is you don't have enough people. That's it. And you're short staff. That's it. But I hate to break it to you. You still need the people. That's right. So how should we be thinking about our corporate brand to attract talent and then to invest in our talent so that we're competitive today in yeah. this market? One thing that I love to ask business owners or, or senior leaders is, what's your brand promise? Here's my logo. Here's my font. Here are our colors. Look at the splashy ad we just did. And I'm like, awesome. What are you promising mm -hmm. your customers to have as an experience when they do business with your brand? Hmm. Okay, let's let's just slow it all down. What do you do? Mm -hmm. Who do you do it for? And how do you do it uniquely? That's yep. your brand. Yeah. Let's just figure that part out first. Okay. So if that's what you're promising people, mm -hmm. don't you want your employees to know that that's the promise that they're charged with keeping up? Like that's mm -hmm. a pretty big deal, but they don't have that. And the mm -hmm. other thing is, well, what are we measuring success on? So Gaylord Hotels, friendly, helpful prompt. There was a 20 question survey that went out to guests but the only ones that made a difference in the quarterly bonuses for our front line, friendly, helpful, prompt. So guess what we were psycho-focused about? We were friendly to every single guest. We were friendly to each other. We were friendly to vendors. We were friendly to everybody. <laughs> because if you were going to measure me on friendly, by golly, I was getting a five out of a five on that one. Mm -hmm. Were you helpful? Did you solve their problem? If they were lost and they're in one atrium and they needed to be in another atrium, did you physically walk them to their destination so they no longer felt lost? Were the, you helpful? Making Disney look a little shabby. Listen, we did. Because yeah. I've spent a lot of money at Disney and I was like, I don't know what's so impressive about this, but I did not have that experience. I did better at Gaylord Hotels. 
So no offense, Disney, but we could have gone to Europe for this money and then treated it better. <laughs> Anyways. Okay. So friendly, helpful, and then prompt. Did you solve their problem quickly? I mean, just think about all the times you've stayed on hold or, no. well, I don't know. I'm new here. I didn't figure it. Let me put you through this. And so now this person's frustration is bubbling and boiling and imploding. And so you need to be sure, first and foremost, that you understand your brand. Mm -hmm. So something that I do with companies mm -hmm. is a whole brand guide. And so they're like, okay, when do we get to the fonts part? And I'm like, dude, mostly men. No <laughs> offense. Are you going to illustrate the storybook and then write the story? Like, I'm confused. Is that how yeah. we do it? And it's like, no, you got to write the book. You got to tell the story and then we'll draw the images to make the story come to life. Right. So we have to do a brand messaging guide. Who are we even talking to? Who are we targeting? Right. I mean, that's a huge deal. And people are like, oh, everybody, if they have money, we will take <laughs> it. No, 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 no. That's not how that works. That's yeah. not how, I mean, so I have the Bombshell Business Podcast. I have so many what we call bombshell boys who listen mm -hmm. because it's not about leaving them out. It's just that when I speak to the true pain points of a woman in business mm -hmm. and I start there, everything else is for everybody. I yeah. mean, women don't have a different business world than men no. do. It's all the same. We're all playing in it together. Yes. And the, we're all going to get measured by the same result at the end of the day. Amen, sis. And, and that's how it should be. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, how we talk about it, just like the Women's Summit, is such a different conference than any other conference right. because it's designed to meet the needs of women. So because I do that, that's great. But I have more male CEO clients mm -hmm. than women, period, under discussion. So when I'm asking people to really niche down and understand your brand, mm -hmm. to bring it back full circle, you need to understand what you're promising. You need to understand who you're serving. And then you'll get other people who are also interested in that. But you're going to knock those people in between the eyes. Right. They're going to want to do business mm -hmm. with you. And then you have to understand what makes you unique. Again, it's like, oh, we have great customer service. I'm sorry, my friend. Unless you are American <laughs> Express, you do not get to hang your hat on that one. So what else? <laughs> what else you got? Right. So getting very clear on more of the brand messaging, the brand experience, mm -hmm. the emotional connection that your brand makes with its customers. Customers. We get that under control. Okay, now what does that look like for the employee experience? Right. So this is who we're serving. This is what we're trying to accomplish. These are our operational goals. This is our mission, our vision, our values. So how we do business is this. So now you have your culture, which is the birthplace of the brand. And now you're bringing your team into that. And you're mm -hmm. saying, okay, you're gifted in these areas. Well, your job in marketing is to X, Y, Z so that we can get here. <laughs> And by the way, this is the promise that we're making to our customers. Never forget that. Okay, IT, you're not the no department. It's your job <laughs> <laughs> to ensure that the technology is set so we can meet this promise. And we're going to do it according to our values so that we can live out our mission and ultimately get to our vision. Are you on board with that? Great. Fantastic. Okay, marketing, you know you cannot live without IT. Also, IT, guess what? Security, they're your homies. Mm -hmm. We need security to be on our team. We need operations. We need finance. We need all these different things. You have to show how each of these distinct units, who, by the way, all these departments have their own little sub brands too, of how they do business and how mm -hmm. they contribute to the big picture, but you still have to tie it into the big picture. So I'll give you an example. I did How to Fascinate with a Bristol Bay Native Corporation in Anchorage, Alaska. Okay. And they are a Native American owned organization that has multiple corporations and also they are charged with protecting the native land in their area. I can go on and the yeah. native lifestyle, li living out the native culture and the way that mm. their data shook out was just so aligned, like who they've hired is so aligned with the work that they do. And I was able to unpack and do a really deep dive on their data mm. to explain to them, hey, here's why you already rock. Mm -hmm. Now here are the blind spots that you might have. Because you don't have this on the team and mm -hmm. you're very dormant in these areas on the team. And so you need to pull from the 9% of people that have this that the rest of everybody doesn't right. so that <laughs> the work of the whole can then be amplified. So when you're looking at what it is that you're trying to accomplish and then you boil it all the way down to, OK, who's actually doing the work? That's how your business brand then is infused into your employer brand. And we market mm -hmm. to people to gain market share. Well, guess what talent attraction is? Talent acquisition is just marketing. Yeah. And so we have to market in a fun, sexy, compelling way. Y'all stop it with these job descriptions as your job ads. I mean, yes. you're making our eyes bleed. That yes. is an HR document. You can have that discussion in the screening call, call if you want to, but do not put that on the LinkedIn. Do not put that on the Indeed. 
that is just like seven key areas yeah. and then speak to the heart of the person just like Nike speaks to the heart of their consumer. Speak to the heart of the person you want to come work for you. Tell them why mm. they're the perfect fit. Don't, oh, we're an excellent company <laughs> with great customer service and we've been around for 25 years. Nobody cares. Right. Nobody does. Because it's what's in it for me. What's in why, it for me? Why am I going to be happy there? Are you a dynamic person who loves ever-evolving environments and in a friendly place where you have a sense of belonging. Whoever you are can show up to work and mm -hmm. be your best self because we're going to plug into you and you're going to help the whole because we are about team. Now, yep. if I'm a Lone Ranger, I don't want to work there. And guess what? I want my ad to turn you off, yeah. just like marketing. And so the other thing hmm. about marketing is when you buy, what's a brand that you like? Um, pick one. <laughs> okay, Celsius. I still keep hoping that I get a case of this at some point. Yes, come on now. We've got free product placement here. There should be some sponsorship dollars. So let's just say it's Fiji. And let's just say that you entered some contest or you subscribe to them or you follow them on social media. They know you're already drinking Fiji water, but they're going to continue to retarget at you and then they're going to follow you all around the internet yes. telling you how great Fiji is because oh, they're going to know oh they follow us on Facebook mm -hmm. and I've got a cookie on them on my website so now when she goes on Facebook there's going to be a Fiji ad and when she opens up her Gmail there's going to be a or Fiji Amazon. ad or Amazon or any <laughs> of the above because they're retargeting you yeah well you can't just hire somebody and be like this is how we are. Come on, come, come play mm -hmm. with us. You have to retarget your employees. You have to remind them of their total compensation. You have yeah. to remind them like, oh yeah, if you go up the road, yes, you could probably make a dollar more an hour, but do you have to supply your own tools? Mm -hmm. Well, let's amortize that over the course of the next two years. Yeah. You finally get your raise in two years. Yeah. If somebody is with a company for three years, that is a long tenure nowadays. First of all, we need to manage our expectations of, mm -hmm. you know, how people are you know, moving also because we're a lot more able to move around the country now as as opposed to before. It's easier to do that. But the key thing is if you want to keep somebody from going down the street for another dollar an hour and they can just move into that apartment or, you know, whatever that looks like, it really is a sense of belonging. But how do we get there? It's communication. It's recognition. It is ensuring that your family is excited about you working there and invite the family so they can see, oh, my husband got an award. My wife got an award. My girlfriend got an award. My mama got an oh, award. Oh, they have an opinion about the workplace. They do. Whether you want to acknowledge it or not, that is something we have tried to focus on ourselves over the years, especially in a startup phase. You ask so much of your team that you have to be cognizant of their partners. And if they're late to dinner, again, then you want that partner to say, yeah, but man, they treat you really good. Mm -hmm. And our insurance is covered by them. And we are blessed that we can sustain our life and go on vacation because they take good care of us. Yeah, That's what you want the family saying, not... Well, and, you, and I think maybe that's something people are losing sight of right now. Employee churn. We know how much you lose if you have to flip an employee, right? So you're you're going to have downtime. I love that you said about remarketing to your own employees. You got to remind them why it's great to work for you. Yeah. What and have you done for me lately? Exactly. Exactly. But also I'm getting their buy-in about yes. how what they do but delivers on that brand. And I'm thinking like, you know, that's a great tip. And so for everybody that's listening out there, now is never too late to stop. That's your perfect opportunity to yeah. come back in and revisit with them and, and reestablish the value of your brand, why it matters. Like, why is that, why is that our mission? Because you're right. I have seen so many mission statements that are like to deliver maximum NOI. Nobody leaps out of bed and goes, I can't wait to go work for fill in the blank of your business name. Like mm -hmm. nobody does, but they do get out of bed because they've got a mortgage or rent mm -hmm. to pay and Little Bobby needs a new baseball bat for travel ball and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and Susie's taking dance lessons and man, she's growing like a weed and I just bought her all these clothes, but now I got to buy more clothes. And so this job yep. allows me to plug in my gifts so I can do all of this mm -hmm. now. That's baseline the truth. And I say the Amber Hurdle definition of business is you have a problem. I solve your problem. You give me money. That's business. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what happens with employees? They solve a problem for you because you can't be all the things. So right. you have to have a whole symphony of instruments playing to get the, the concerto done. They solve the problem. You give them money. Mm -hmm. And that's right. employment. Yes. So if that's the case, then don't you want to give them like a nice violin solo? Mm -hmm. Don't you want to show them how oh, I like that they make the music that without the violin or without the piano, it's not the same song like we mm -hmm. need you. Mm -hmm. And so when you give that kind of recognition and just honor that, like, hey, the things that you're naturally gifted at and the, the things that you're offering us in exchange for your paycheck, like have to have those. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody's replaceable. <laughs> Let's be clear. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we're appreciative that you have chosen us 
yeah. as much as we have chosen you. We think about the corporate brand and how important it is and where you start, what you have to define. How do you think about taking that down to helping somebody, young professionals, yeah. think about their personal brand? Because I think there might be a tendency to like stay away from it. Yeah. Let me just make it really easy and just demystify it all. All your personal brand is is your professional reputation. That's mm -hmm. it. That's it. And so we don't have to be on the TikTok to do it. Personal brand isn't like a, it's not a public relations campaign. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not like your LinkedIn experience. I mean, that's part of what pushes out your personal brand, but all your personal brand is my favorite definition is Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon says it's what people are saying about you when you're not in the room. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go back to PR 101 and mm -hmm. you can frame the narrative or somebody else is going to. Yeah. So let's just say that you're, I mean, not like us or anything, but like you're a little <laughs> high energy and opinionated. Maybe sometimes you could be perceived as bossy. I don't know. And so we could allow people to frame that narrative and tell us who we are and not only tell us who we are, but in different meetings when there are decisions about who's going to get what project or, or are we going to promote this person to mm -hmm. assistant manager or leasing agent or whatever? Are we going to give a raise mm -hmm. to our maintenance person? I mean, there's all kinds of conversations happening. And so that conversation is happening based on your personal brand. The, the reason why I do branding and personal branding is probably the most intimate is I say that I sell branding, but I deliver confidence because when you're confident on the value that you offer, mm -hmm. whether it's a business or an employment opportunity or emerging leader, you have to sell your value to get mm -hmm. the right people and the right opportunities to come to me, to you. Mm -hmm. You were attracted to me and my personal brand because I was transparent about who I am and what I'm about. And you connected with that because we yes. have so much in common. If I hid that under a bushel, then you wouldn't have known that and right. I wouldn't be sitting here. And so there's that element of just people and opportunities. But then there's also of if I have a confident employee, is that person going to serve our community better? Is this person going to be more confident interacting with other team members. If the owners come in, what does that look like? Isn't it incumbent upon you as the most senior leader, you know, in, in the company to be sure that everyone who represents your brand mm -hmm. represents it well, professionally and confidently? Like, let's just say I was terrible at invoicing. Not that I can't do it. I just don't prefer to. But if I knew that I was really good at getting people to pay their bills, mm -hmm. I was really good at getting people to prioritize their storage unit fee as opposed to the or cable fee, let's okay. just say. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't I lean into that? And so now it's not like Amber sucks at numbers. It's Amber's really good at getting the numbers up because she's amazing with what? Highest in passion, relationships. Mm -hmm. yep. So if I know that about Amber, I have some mm -hmm. data on Amber, and I know that I can put her in the role of collections or just nudging people for their rent. Oh, well, I don't know if you're aware of this from the, the, the data that's out there, but uh, yeah, our industry is having a serious delinquency issue at the moment. The press doesn't like to talk about that part of our rental challenges. They like to talk about those rent gains that were in the past, the last you know year and a half, two years ago, which by the way, the year before that wasn't that, mm -hmm. but they don't take the five-year average, but our industry is really challenging with it. And it's funny, as soon as you said that, I'm sitting here thinking, if I'm an operator and we're looking at centralization, because that's a hot topic, what can we centralize? Yeah. And you're exactly right. If you know the skill sets of your your team, Lord knows you got somebody out there that's good at helping people like really think through their personal budgets and they're prioritizing a great thing to bring them into the corporate office and make those phone calls and even better work your bad debt collections so yeah. that you don't even have to write them off and you get, actually keep more of your bad debt. Because I can say this from experience. The people who called me are like, you owe money and we're coming after you. I'd be like, next. But the people who are like, what's going on right now? It's like, well, I worked this job. I worked four jobs. I did this. I'm still going to be $30 short, but I'm going to get every because they worked with me. So if somebody has that gift, then great. That's Put their them. personal brand. Yep. They're great with people. And so yep. we're not going to worry about the fact that they're maybe can't add two and two together in their head Four, I think. But <laughs> again, not my spiritual gift. So we just have to, when we're talking about building people's personal brands, you have to look in, look at them and pull out what they're best at. Like, mm -hmm. what are you already good at? Let's do more of that. Become more of who you already are. Right. And then figure out, well, okay, now what makes me different? Just like we want to know what makes us different as a company, we need to understand what makes us different as an individual. And that could just be your history. 
<laughs> I don't know how many Southern sounding keynote speakers got knocked up at 16 years old, had, you know, the kind of business success that I've had and is in it every single day and can talk about it. Like, that's uniquely me. Nobody else gets to be that. Nobody else mm-hmm. gets to be the Velvet Machete. That's me. Like, Wait, the what? The Velvet Machete. Oh, my God. Is that your stripper name? <laughs> that is my stripper name. Yes. There's a story behind that, just for the record. <laughs> and it has to do with there's an app that might have been played with at a team meeting. It was quite creative. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only reason I would have guessed that. <laughs> a, a personal training client of, of mine called me that because he said I, I gave him the truth. I'm like, listen, you cannot drink three bourbons every night and have ribeye three nights a week and then come in here and think you're going to work it off. You just can't. And I'm going to fire you if you don't stop because mm-hmm. you're not going to walk around town saying that I'm your personal trainer when you're looking <laughs> like the way you look because people know that your goal is to lose weight and you're not doing it. So get on track or get off the get off the team. Yeah. And he was get like, off the treadmill. <laughs> yeah. Or get off the treadmill. Yeah. So Velvet Machete is just confidence and compassion. That's actually our leadership program is Velvet mm-hmm. Machete Leadership Academy. And the reason why that moniker was my thing is because people know that I'm going to tell you that you've got spinach in your teeth so you don't look like an idiot. Mm -hmm. So that's not a bad thing. It's not a good thing. But you have to be able to see those things in your team and you have to use your velvet machete with your team and and speak truth into them. Mm -hmm. So that's another little thing. If I can go off on that quick tangent, give me 30 seconds. You have to say hard things to your team. You have to do it with velvet. Remember, you have to think about who they are, where they're coming from. And Mm -hmm. speak in a language that is appealing to them. That's the velvet. But the machete is chop, chop. This is a problem. We got to solve it. Most people want to do good work. Don't tell them what they're doing wrong in a way that they can receive it and process it and not be threatened by it. They're never going to get better. And you're screwing them over by not giving them a chance to figure it out. And the longer you wait, the harder that conversation is because Mm -hmm. then it becomes personal. And then it's all machete. And that's unfortunate. So I know that you... You did mention that you did the event planning. Mm -hmm. And so one of the questions I had written down for you before was, because I know that now in your role, like you do public speaking, Mm -hmm. you can be, you work with companies for rebranding, branding new new companies, um, consulting, leadership. But you mentioned that you started with event coordinating and ended up like planning big events for celebrities. I mean, because when you think about building a personal brand, that's the first thing that comes to mind is going to be like, you know, who's got a big brand? I just wonder like, what is that got to be like? And how does that still translate down to the same thing for the, the person that is just thinking about my professional persona? I will just say high profile in general. And now we have all these influencers and everybody's Instagram famous and all that kind of stuff. When people call me an influencer, I'm like, I don't know about that, but okay. I loved Alan Jackson's 50th birthday festival as I lovingly called it. So we went to his house that was in Franklin. They've moved since. And I mean, we had helicopter rides, a fishing tournament. We completely redid his basketball gym, just draped it like it was like the most spectacular wedding in Dubai. I mean, it was just candelabras. I mean, it was just bananas. It was crazy beautiful. If I could find a picture, I'll send it to you for your, for your show notes. And then in addition to that, we had um, where the Rascal Flats played later on in the evening. And, the, and I put a cigar bar there and everything. And there's like a bonfire. And it was just really, it was a very cool experience. But the interesting thing was, the large majority of his guests weren't even other celebrities. I mean, there were some there that, okay. that came, but they were mostly his employees. And so I knew I, I liked him. I <laughs> met every single, every single one of his captains of his various boats, mm-hmm. both from Georgia and Tennessee and his pilots, mm-hmm. everyone. And so what we did talking about personal branding is when they got to the check-in, they could put their name, but then they had to put who they were to Alan. Okay. And so it was like Alan's therapist. Um, oh. <laughs> you know, Alan's punching bag, Alan's like whatever. So they like kind of crafted who they were in a funny way. It was yeah. all very playful and it's super sweet. But they all represented like who what their personal brand was to support his personal brand, mm-hmm. which I found very revealing and interesting. And I was just oh, yeah. having a great time just checking in all of his guests at his party and learning all these different things about him and his people. That's a good example. And then the other one, with, especially with Beyonce coming into the country music industry, when Jessica Simpson came into the country music industry for a hot minute before she became a multi-billionaire fashionista, the record label blew in a bunch of radio DJs from all over the country. Mm-hmm. Because Jessica Simpson's personal brand was, what's chicken of the sea? You know, oh I mean, it was gosh, like, it was really bad. And yes. that was the role that she played to get the the views that she needed for her show or whatever. And she played mm-hmm. along with the dumb blonde thing. Well, billions of dollars later, we know she's not a dumb blonde. But she certainly wasn't welcome in Nashville at the time. She came in and she showed who she really was to all of these DJs. And I'm telling you, when you meet Jessica Simpson in person, it's a different experience than who you think that she is. 
And I'll just say from a personal perspective, I had a rule that if you even took your phone out and even thought about taking a picture, you were fired on the spot. Like, absolutely not. We were very successful because no one was on stage in front of us and they were safe with us. Yeah. But she came to me and said, thank you so much. This was a wonderful event. I can see all the detail that went into it. She went around and thought, thanked every single person and then said, would you like to take a picture? Aww. And I was like, yeah, sure. So Jessica Simpson is the only celebrity picture I've ever taken because they were just like normal yeah. people to me. Right. Yep. But that's her brand. You can look at Beyonce. You can look at Taylor Swift. You can look at all of these people. And what they did intentionally over time was create the storyline that they wanted people to see about mm -hmm. them. We're all multifaceted. Mm -hmm. If I tried to explain all the different sides of Amber, everybody would go run. <laughs> what people need to know is X, Y, and Z. And so we're just going to recycle that. So we need just some some things to be known about. Mm -hmm. And then maybe like five things that you talk about regularly. For those listening, it's not the same as saying you're, it's what about what you're projecting. Because authenticity obviously is very important. Yeah. Which you is know? why Taylor Swift is queen of the universe. Yeah. I was going to say, because I think. I see that sometimes, and, and especially for those of us, like you said, it's very different for our daughters now, and hopefully even more different for their their daughters. But anybody that's trying to build their brand right now, there's so much social media involved. Mm -hmm. And there's this tendency to only show your best side, Yeah, right? But everybody has their bad days. And a lot of times what I'm learning is those best sides are AI generated on top of that. If I see one more... One more headshot that is AI generated where like I've, I actually had an employee and I'm like, does she look like that? No. Completely different. Yeah. Because guess what? You're going to see me in person. So <laughs> no. they airbrushed. My book cover has my face on it. Not because I, I was dying. I was mortified. But testing with my audience, that was what tested remarkably more positive. So I was like, fine, whatever. Well, then you have to blow up the big poster when you go do book signings and you go on book tour. And so they sent it to me and I was like, totally airbrushed, like no, no freckles, no wrinkles. I'm like, no, 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 no. I am not in person standing next to that glamour shot. <laughs> I'm like, I haven't had that skin ever. <laughs> no, never. And I've got a hot dog bun that goes right here when I don't have enough Botox in my forehead. So like, just in case, let's add some back in there. You don't want to be that. I'm not a Swifty. I, I'm not even sure I can name five songs of Taylor no, Swift. Yeah. I really can't. But the reason why people love her is because she's real. Because she talks about real things. Yeah. And that's what people want. You yeah. had to have these opportunities to engage. And we were also mostly belly to belly. So now we're in Zoom rooms and mm -hmm. Teams and, you know, all of these things. And you don't have that same kind of exposure. And especially for women, what are you going to do? Ask your male boss if you can have a private coffee date with him on Zoom. Like there's that th there's a different tension there, I think, mm -hmm. for young women, especially. Yeah. I think there's just there's so many layers for women in general. I'm going to say ignorant. I don't mean stupid. I mean, like, you just don't know. Right. Um, you don't you, have the level of experience. You don't have the level of experience. And so you don't know that you can tell somebody to quack right on off, but because um, you need the job and you mm -hmm. have kids and you have to keep the job. Right. Yep. So there's that level. And your rental discount is tied to it. And your rental discount is tied to it. So you better yeah. keep your mouth shut. Yep. There's that level. So there's like the deeper, like wounded trauma level. And then there's also just like the pressure that comes with being a, a young professional now because everybody's out there and you're like, oh, that person's just crushing it on LinkedIn and I don't even know what to say. I'm just here to tell you right now, you do not even need social media to be successful. I am very successful. You can look at my social media numbers. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, so I, I live on LinkedIn, but like if you go to my Instagram, like you're like, are you, you do branding for a living? But yeah. I'm just like, no, I'm going to blow into an industry. I'm going to meet the top people and then I'll be in that industry. I don't need to like mm -hmm. jazz hands and fireworks on social media to do it. Like I know how to network and I know how to offer value and I know how to position myself. So I don't yeah. have to beg for likes and things mm -hmm. like that. So first I want to encourage you. Yes, social media is a tool, but it's not the end all be all relationships are. Yeah. Because why am I in this room right now? Relationships. Uh huh. And why are you saying like, hey, multifamily industry, I want to introduce you to Amber. It's a relationship. You didn't see some pithy post of mine on social media. Like you got to get in front of people. And I tell people all the time, my life and my success is not my own. First of all, it's God's. But second of all, it's all the people who have put their patch quilt their little patch in my quilt of life. Like I have this beautiful quilt that covers me in life that has so many oh, different like people in it. It's not me. Like the threads are not me. I took something and I ran with it, but I didn't knock down those doors. You would have never seen me on that stage had it not been for Steve Trover opening the door and introducing yeah. me to Amy Hino and Amy Hino putting me on webinars. Like yeah. I had nothing to do with any of this. I'm just sitting here based on relationship. <laughs>
<laughs> She's riding the relationship wave. But it's but, but it's, it's true. I didn't anticipate where we would take the conversation, but I think this is a very important segment because I'm I think about as young people are out there in the market and we see so many hybrid work environments to full remote. Mm -hmm. What about your personal brand when you don't even show your face? I can't. And it's weird for me because we just, we, we obviously came up in it. So it's normal for us. Like, as you said, belly to belly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But for people now, and even people who were in that environment that just went full remote, their resistance to come back and understand how impactful relationships face-to-face -face time is to your career advancement. I'm having a hard time believing you can have the same level of career success. You are. Maybe you can, but I would say that the speed at which you're going to do it is drastically different yeah. because and it's out of sight, out of mind. So when they're talking in the room and you're not in the room and we're leadership strategizing, it's relationship. They remember. They remember who's standing out. They remember who's confident. They remember these things. And if you don't take the opportunity to create those moments. And you don't have to be extroverted. Hmm. I, I mean, you can be somebody who tends to be more pensive, who is more observant. And when you speak, you speak with substance. Mm -hmm. That is as impactful as motor mouth amber, mouth of the South. It truly is, because sometimes I might just go on a tangent and you like, you know, erase 30 percent of what I said because it wasn't relevant. It was rambling versus somebody who might be more quiet. But when they speak up, it's mm -hmm. really something that everybody needs to consider right. and think about. And you know that if they're speaking up, it's because there's substance to it. There's power in that, but there's also power. Communication isn't just voice or text. Mm -hmm. So we can't be keyboard warriors. Mm -hmm. You have to show up and show your body language. Yeah. Lean in, show that you're interested. When somebody does something great, like, you know, mm -hmm. show that you're involved, show that you're a part of it. And leaders need to be looking for that on their team. Mm -hmm. Because if the person that you're thinking about promoting never turns their camera on and they're not engaging, who are they going to lead? Right. Amen. That's a very valuable nugget right there. I'm not showing up to participate fully, but you think I'm going to empower and inspire other people to show up fully? Like that is a piece of communication that that mm -hmm. person is providing with no words coming out of their mouth. Mm -hmm. Showing you can be more than just an individual contributor. That's right. And I if that's remember. all you want. And that's fine. That's great. In the past, I've had experiences with people who want to lead. And to be able to lead people, you have to be able to engage with them. Mm -hmm. And so you're not even engaging with me, right? So we've got to find a way to break past that. It's interesting because it's still a competitive market, even though we have, what'd you say, seven jobs or seven people for every job? Wait, what'd you say that? It was back. Point seven applicants. Oh, okay. Yeah. I heard seven in my no. in my headphone here. Yeah. And oh so gosh, what people seven. are doing is like, can you fog a mirror? You're hired. Mm -hmm. That's not a good strategy either. No. That's no. like that's like getting a customer who's your anti-customer, that's mm -hmm. not your ideal customer, who's just nothing but a pain in the butt, and they're going to return things, and they're going to expect more, and they're going to take more. And like you don't want that customer. Well, you don't want that employee because they could yeah. be cancerous. There was one in there in particular I wanted to come back to. Okay. When we're talking about future trends and strategy, I was curious about this, about the misalignment between people strategies and business strategies. Mm -hmm. And have, have you come across that? Because you're consulting, right? So what's an example of that? Oh, gosh. Okay, let's see. I signed so many NDAs. So and, and I, <laughs> I offer them. So because, you know, that everything is pretty proprietary. I'll just okay. So employer brand central is my agency. We wholly focus on the employee experience from the talent acquisition side mm -hmm. to onboarding engagement and even offboarding, which that is not give me the keys and we're locking you out of the tech like it's so much more than that. In that brand, we have really passionate small to mid market businesses mm -hmm. who love what they do. Okay. And they're good people and they have these goals and then they have all these employees who are just doing these jobs. And there's nothing that is bringing in any cohesion. And I guess I'll just kind of call back to some of the things we've already talked about. Like, mm -hmm. are you clear on your mission? Why are you even in business? Does everybody know that? Does everybody understand why you're in business? Because if not, then you've got this person wanting to do it this way and this person wanting to do it that way. Now you have friction, you have uncertainty, you have confusion in the company. Well, that's not moving you towards operational excellence. You have to know what your values are. Those are your family rules. This is how we're going to do business. We say mm -hmm. yes if it aligns with this. If it doesn't align with this, it's a no. So a big word for me is harmony. Mm. I make decisions based on harmony. This is moving me towards harmony. All day long. Okay. You move me away from harmony, you got to go. I don't care who you are. You got to go. 
Mm -hmm. opportunity person, whatever. So our values are that. This is just like foundationally, your culture is what starts the people strategy. Now it's like, okay, how do we mobilize all of these people who have agreed to the family rules of how we're doing business? And they all understand why we're even a company. And they also understand what we're promising our customers through our brand promise. Now we have to make sure that every department isn't working in a silo. I know it's really hard, but we have to actually create operational goals that trickle down from the top. And we have to talk about the money. And we have to help people understand that that sounds really interesting. And I know that you think that that might be fun, but that does nothing to get us to where we're trying to go. And so you have all of these different departments that are just lone rangers doing their own thing. And then you're trying to run a business and you don't understand why you have all of this overhead, but you're not profitable. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a leaky bucket because people are like, this company doesn't know what the heck they're doing. And so I got to go. You know, I don't know where I plug in. It makes no sense to me. There is no direction here. I'm frustrated. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. So when you don't have a people strategy where you have, these are the 2024 operational goals. This is where we're trying to go, which, by the way, is going to get us five years down the road to where we're trying to go. Mm -hmm. Or it's also going to meet almighty EBITDA if you're in that space. (laughs) Once you have that, then you need to trickle that down to the department level. Mm -hmm. Well, what is this department going to do in order to get us there? Okay, Mm -hmm. so then... Now we're going to get it down to the individual level. And I don't care if you're the person who is scrubbing toilets, which, by the way, is one of the most important jobs in the country right now. I mean, Mm -hmm. it just is the backbone of hotels, vacation rentals. So I'm not dismissing that, but that person needs to understand what their goals are. Mm -hmm. That person needs to understand how many rooms do you need to turn in a day. That person needs to understand what what type of customer satisfaction score do we want on cleanliness and are Mm -hmm. you meeting that? Yep. So if you don't have KPIs in place that are informing the team of what the people strategy even is, and if your senior leadership doesn't understand how we're mobilizing everybody and we're trying to get everybody to go in the same direction, which now isn't just about we're all meeting our goals. Now we have to have communication. Now we have to have recognition for the people who are doing it right. Now we have to have all kinds of engagement strategies. We have to have team camaraderie so that we're working more effectively as a team. Are you storming? Are you norming? Are you performing? Like, where are we? And on this <laughs> variety of things that we're, we're trying to accomplish together. And then here's a big one for our Gen Zers, well-being. So how many of you have heard that I need work-life balance, so I can't work on Saturdays? Well, it's your job to work on Saturdays because we're open on Saturdays. So if mm-hmm. you're not working on Saturday, who is going to work on Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> and so here's here's the, the the verbiage I like to share with people is I understand that this is a struggle for you or maybe it's somebody who just is missing the mark. They're not doing their best work. They're not getting it done. They're not doing it accurately. We had a mm-hmm. conversation about that earlier. So it's like I have a budget based on our profitability or our, our revenue stream to get this job done. I think you would be great at taking this money to get this job done. <laughs> but if you can't get this job done, I can't afford for you to take your money and not get the job done. Mm -hmm. So the options are, can you do the job and I will give you the money for it and I'd be so happy to. Or is this just not for you and we need to find somebody who can actually get these things done because it has to be done. There is no give money, not get the product. So you remove the emotion Mm -hmm. and you make it about the job that's being done. Now, if you're doing employer branding, right, and your people strategy is aligned with your business strategy, then you're going to have all these other things that make this person feel seen and supported and obviously Mm -hmm. recognized and everything. So the Gottman Institute, and I'm kind of off on a tangent a little bit here, but the Gottman Institute says for a healthy relationship, you have to have five deposits in emotional bank account. For every one withdrawal. Mm. I'm going to say that again. Five deposits, five positive deposits in an emotional bank account for every one withdrawal or you bankrupt. So what do you think happens? I I can't even use the term that I want to use right now. But when you just lay into somebody at work because they're not doing their job and you're late and you make it all about emotional stuff. Mm -hmm. That has nothing to do with the business strategy. That has nothing to do with the people strategy that's moving you towards your business strategy. Yeah. That is your emotional reaction of being frustrated about a core issue that you're not addressing. Mm -hmm. And so what would it look like if you invested, 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 invested with recognition, with praise in a way that is meaningful to them, with giving them well-being opportunities? Here's a Calm app. You know, we're going to do yoga on the lawn on Saturdays or, you know, whatever that looks like. We'll offset your... Healthcare. We provide therapists. We have a massage therapist come every quarter to take care of everybody, whatever that looks like. If you're doing all of those things, when you do go have a crucial conversation about not hitting the mark, you're not bankrupting that. Yeah. So they understand they're educated. 
they're well, they're educated, but they're also invested in. Mm -hmm. I'll give an example. My partner and I, I might have been a little bratty the other night. I didn't mean to be, but I was. But I've made so many deposits that that withdrawal didn't. It was just like, yeah, I didn't really like how that felt. Like, <laughs> what if you said it this way? And I'm like, that would have been way better if I would have said it that way. So I was able to receive the feedback. Course correct. Mm -hmm. But I didn't bankrupt with my brattiness and that sentence that I said because yep. I had deposits. So I just want everybody to think about your people strategy has human beings with emotional conditions mm -hmm. and a wagon full of experiences that they drag behind them in life. Mm -hmm. And so if you want the business strategy to win, we want to increase market share by 30 percent. We want to increase revenue by you know, 15% by Q2, whatever those look like, guess mm -hmm. what? Those wagons are coming for you mm -hmm. because those people <laughs> are humans. And you asked about what's, you know, what do we need to look to moving forward? And I've done presentations, keynotes on this post pandemic. We do not make purchasing decisions or employment decisions on data anymore. We kind of had that conversation pre. Some of us do make decisions based on data facts figures. Some of us make it on mm -hmm. gut instincts and things like that. But from a branding perspective, it is an emotional connection. You are emotionally committed to Fiji water for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why. I enjoy Fiji water too. Always have. But you're drawn to this and not something else. Is that logic? Is this water so much better than other water? Or is there something about this yeah. that triggers you emotionally to come back to it? It's a very pretty flower. <laughs> It is a pretty flower. No, but you're right. Like, what is it? Why? But there is a reason. Fiji, that's a sexy word. Everybody wants to go to Fiji. It does have a beautiful flower. So it takes me to my vacation spot in my spring. This versus Sam's Club water. You're going to choose this because it inspires something in you. Yeah. It's the same thing in employer branding. It's the same thing in personal branding. It's the same thing yeah. in business branding. So if you want business results, you have to deal with those pesky emotions and you have to deal with the people and part of your people strategy is harnessing all of the gifts, talents, expectations, mm -hmm. their pedigree, everything, and move it towards that business strategy in a very strategic way. Yeah. We have marketing strategies. Why don't you have employment strategies? Yeah, I love this. I think you are dead over the target. There's so much focus on data and there is great insights in data. Data tells us a lot, for the most part, reflecting the past. And data can be manipulated. That is true, too. But I do say, because I love data, I'm right on the cusp of how mm -hmm. I make my decisions. Data always infor informs the strategy. And the reason why we look to the past is so we can anticipate the future. Right. And so if you're looking at like your revenue yep. for the past three years, and of course, we had, you know, wonky COVID times or whatever. So now we're kind of like, oh, OK, this is a new normal. Now we have three years of history that we can maybe kind of sort of mm -hmm. reflect on to anticipate the future. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing with your people. You have to have data on them, too. Yeah. You you can't lose sight of the emotion. But relationships come from emotion. Yeah. Are you selling four walls with a ceiling fan in it and no. a cable connection? It's a lifestyle. You're selling a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle in our community. Why would people you? People are happy here. And families thrive. And, you're and little, your fur babies are taken care of. Yes. And we <laughs> will microchip them. So if you're not a fur baby person, somebody's dog is not going to mess in front of your house because we've got that managed too. There's a strategy for that so mm -hmm. that your emotional condition does not come unraveled as a resident. Yes. <laughs> I love that. That's another nugget. <laughs> I mean, there's lots of nuggets today. There, everything is emotion. Mm -hmm. And even the most jack wagon bosses out there, that's emotion. Mm -hmm. You're a jerk. Because you're emotionally triggered easily. Mm -hmm. Why? Why do you dysregulate? Oh, my gosh. There's so much that we had to share today. <laughs> and we are coming up on our time. Wait a second. <laughs> I know. It goes by. Didn't it go by fast? It goes by so fast. It goes by so fast. Um, I was just going to say, like, thank you for coming and, and talking. And I, I hope we will have a, a repeat of appearance here where we can dive into some more details of some specifics. Because you have really shared some valuable things that I think that our industry can take away from. We have so many challenges right now coming up in 24. Um, and a lot of what you said, and I'm already thinking through this, is we're talking about our people strategy and meeting those emotional needs, but also their very real needs of pay and, and how they survive and take care of their families. And we want to take care of our people so they take care of our residents. That's it. Right. And retention is going to make or break management companies this year. 2024 is about retention because, yeah. and forgive me, I don't know this stat on the, the vacation side, and it probably varies quite a bit by asset level, but right now, 
it looks like average turn cost if you are turning a unit and you don't renew the resident is like seventy six hundred dollars. Mm. It was thirty five hundred to five thousand for so long, but that's substantial. Yeah, and I, I think I added up. You're talking like a six hundred dollar a month rent increase on the new resident in a concession-driven market to make up those turn costs. That's going to be a challenge. That doesn't make sense. What you said about the company's brand and how you filter that down through to everyone in your organization so that they They understand. They should be proud. And when they understand why you do what you do, then it's much easier for them to hold the line, do the things they need to, but do it in a way that supports our brand mission of being friendly and a great place to live. You'll get those results. And you're going to need it this year. And so I think if I had one last question, it's where do you start? What if you have an entire employee? Like I said, what if what if your mission statement is all about NOI for investors? You need to be clearing your brand promise first and foremost, because otherwise, what are you inspiring everybody? So it's okay to change it. It's totally okay to change it. Absolutely. (laughs) So maybe have a little summit. And I'm not even saying you need to have your employees help with this. This Mm -hmm. this is more of a senior leader, like, you know, Mm -hmm. top down kind of. Thing. But then once you have it set, live it. Dust your culture off. Get it out of the drawer or off the pin board that it's in the break room. And and your intended, cult, well, your desired, culture. your desired culture. You have one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have a culture. Now I don't know if it's the one you meant for it to be, but whatever your written down culture is that you aspired for, that's something that needs to be lived and breathed every single day. So when you are coaching, counseling, and disciplining, it's not like. You are always late and I'm just sick and tired of you being late. It's, hey, I've noticed that there's a pattern of being late. And what happens is Susie can't get to her kid at after school care on time. And now she's incurring fees. So it's adding stress to her. It's adding stress to little Timmy. And it's actually causing financial stress. And one of our values is teamwork. And this doesn't feel like teamwork. When you don't get to work on time, it's taking away from the value of teamwork. What's your plan for that? Oh, I just, I'm going to have to get up earlier. Or like I I have a struggle meeting with my ex with my kids or whatever. Let me figure that part out. It's not like you're a bad person. You suck. Mm-hmm. It's you agreed to teamwork as a culture piece when you came to work here. And so we're going to uphold that. What's your plan to uphold that? Mm-hmm. The culture is so, so important. And if I can add a layer at Employer Brand Central, we operate again in four buckets. So what I want you to do is think about the attract phase. What's broken? What is your biggest pain point in talent acquisition and recruiting? What's the hardest thing? Just worry about that in the next quarter. Then I want you to think about onboarding. Are you onboarding your team? Because you lose 20 (laughs) to 30% of them in the first 90 days because you sold them one thing and then they came on board and you didn't give them any of the tools or resources to do this fabulous job that you sold them on Mm -hmm. when you were recruiting. So think about your onboarding process. What's the most broken thing that you can fix? The highest value. Mm -hmm. Then I want you to think about the engage phase. So the engagement is pretty much the life cycle of your employee. So that could be recognition. That could be events. That could be communication. What is most broken that keeps Mm -hmm. your team members disengaged? What can you do to improve upon that? And then the exit, the offboarding phase, what's broken there? Are they talking smack about you around town? (laughs) Why? Because guess what? In these communities where where your multifamily units are, people talk. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, don't go work over there. They don't pay on time. Don't work over there. They treat you like trash. Don't go work over there. They let our residents walk all over us. Don't go over there because they'll hire anybody that can fog a mirror. And so what is the experience on their way out the door to ensure that you can attract people back into the door? And are you setting your team up for success when that person walks out the door? So responsibilities are equally distributed and nobody's getting burdened with three jobs at once. Yeah. So again, get your culture out, use it, talk about it every single meeting, every single time you're promoting, no matter what culture is a part of the conversation. And then look at your four areas, what I call the employer brand loop, attract, onboard, engage, offboard, pick your biggest pain point in there, solve it, and then measure your results. Yeah. And just one, and that's it, taking the one biggest pain point, one a quarter, that to me seems very doable. If you want to boil the ocean, good luck with that. But yeah, that's, good luck. <laughs> that's not going to happen anytime yeah, soon. It's not. Or you can hire us for an affordable monthly rate and we'll walk you through it. Yes. <laughs> yes. As a, and you know what's funny? We don't normally talk about products or services or positioning, but I just think this is such a key area. Our churn in this industry has been ridiculous for a long time. Like historically, even before the Great Resignation, it was just we we're statistically high compared to other industries. And there's so much opportunity and there's so much you can do in this space. You know, it's something we always continue to work on. There's some companies that do a really great job mm-hmm. at it. But as a whole, we still have work to do. Yeah. So I, I I really appreciate you sharing everything that you did. And I think 
out of everything everybody's looking to tackle, because I have these conversations every day for 2024, we always say, go back to the basics. This is pretty freaking basic. Be like, brilliant with the basics is what I say oh, to my customers all the time. Okay. We're going to have to, we're, I'm going to have to borrow that. Yeah, take be it. Be brilliant with the basics. Instead of going back to the basics, we're going to be brilliant with the basics. Because listen, we all know, get on the treadmill and walk on it for 20 minutes. But do we do it? No. <laughs> So I don't want to hear like, oh, I know to do that. No, but are you doing it? And are you doing it with excellence? <laughs> Even when I was on the treadmill, I can guarantee I wasn't doing it with excellence. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know why I thought I could get on an inclining treadmill and put it at like 45 degrees right off the bat. <laughs> because you were trying to boil the ocean. <laughs> I was. Good point. Good point. Good point. Touche. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank um, you. I was going to say, we will we'll definitely share Amber's information so that people can find you and connect with you. Is there any place you like to people to connect with you? Definitely LinkedIn. Yes. Sometimes I get crazy because I do run two companies, um, and but I do try to stay pretty involved on LinkedIn because that's where business people go. Yes. You know, I don't need cat videos. I don't need dances on TikTok. I just want to talk about business. Yeah. And I found that too. I, I'm terrible. I don't know what's happened. I'm just not Facebook anymore. I just, I, I'm time wise, I'm prioritizing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do, I find a lot of my good connections business wise. Yeah. Um, are on LinkedIn. So build your LinkedIn profile, people. Yes. So if you're coming up in your young professional, personal let's start brand there. 101. That's 101. <laughs> Amen. Well, thank you again, thank guys. You. And um, you guys, we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>